I found it interesting on the wire this morning. There's a uh, press release out of Ford that uh, the new Explorer uh, fuel efficiency, I think it was 25 or 28 percent better than the model that's replacing. And this is being extolled as this wonderful technology and they're using EcoBoost and all kinds of technology to do it. At the end of the article, the fuel efficiency, this is a U.S. article, was 25 miles per gallon. The U.S. government has mandated 35 and a half. <laughs> right. And so yeah. they just go from wherever they were, you know, 21 or 2 up to 24 or 25 miles per gallon. And they're still 10 miles per gallon short. Like at some point, you know, we're going to hit this wall. Is that, like, is this even possible to achieve? Well, some of these things. What, what's happening on the product front is, as we all know, is uh, it's being pushed towards electrics, be they plug-in hybrids or, uh, or just hybrids or even pure uh, plug-in vehicles. We've got companies like, new companies like Tesla, who are out there right now with a very high-end sports car, but they're coming with a mid-range mid uh, family car that's going to be pure electric. Is there going to be any market for them? How much money does a dealer make through the history of the vehicle repairing? All those right. pickup trucks and those gas guzzlers over the years. I, I no. think Chuck and I, we're looking at $10,000 of profit for a dealer through the life of a vehicle. How much is going to be profit in, in the life of a plug-in electric where there's no engine? <laughs> but, but there's complicated electronics. I, I would probably argue that there's going to be more. But the skill base of, of the people that are in the dealership are going to be totally different than what they are now. And so, or, like, uh, but there's going to be even more plug-in componentry as opposed to yeah. doing actual work on the vehicle. It's going to be yeah, swap be, this, swap yeah. that, swap yeah. this, swap that. Or are we entering into future division of the vehicle into different franchises, different suppliers? So maybe the dealer in the future isn't going to do 100% of everything for a vehicle. Maybe he's only going to focus on a certain piece, maybe the electronics piece, is going to be a total other franchise, and you're going to bring your vehicle if it's got an electronics problem over here, uh, as Ford, opposed to the dealer. Ford in the sink, Ford sink, Best Buy, Future Shop. Okay, that's the t that's the tip of the edge. But you know, Ford's argument is, well, here's the experts, so let's let's do it. And in the end, it's going to drive business back to Ford. So they're doing it as a but, but if I'm a dealer, I'm going to put a lot of pressure on the manufacturer to say. No, no, no. I, I want all that. The sales. dealer is completely out of the loop at that point. Completely out of the loop. And that, to me, is something that uh, could easily happen with batteries, could easily happen with all of this new electronic gadgetry that's coming out with, with vehicles in terms of you know, replacing the engine. You've now got plug-in uh, plug EV. Okay, that gets, that gets fixed over here. What's going to be left for the dealer at the end of the day? That's the biggest where, where's, the, where's the revenue stream now? Where's where where are they most profitable? Profitable is fixed operations. And so now we're, now now they're now they're going to agree to give that away. Yeah, I know it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but sense. I think I think the infrastructure that the dealers have actually today will mandate that the cars go there because you can't bring your car at uh, at the electronic shop. I mean. Uh, Bring it in. Okay, with sync it might work, but any co other components. So I think the infrastructure. I think it, the manufacturers and the dealers will have to find a way to handle that business through skill development or something like that. Well, let me ask but, you a quick question: Is it easier to change infrastructure or to change people, or, or to train people and change attitudes? If, if you're telling me, I'm not sure Best Buy has the infrastructure to service more sophisticated electronics on the car, I know they have space out back, it's probably easier to add the infrastructure yeah. out back than it is to try to change the generation of service. Canadian Tire uh, has a, a hybrid of that concept, sorry Dennis, they have a, a store in the front and then they have service shop at the back as a, as a necessary evil because they sell their auto parts. But you talk to a Canadian Tire dealer and they call it a necessary evil. I mean, they've tried over time and still trying to improve that part of the business. But 80% of the profit comes from the, the store itself and maybe 20% if that comes from the service department. But the service department takes a lot of space, causes them a lot of headaches compared to in proportion. So I'm not sure if, uh, it, it, if, you, if you look at the complexity of a car dealership, all the business in the car dealership, 
and what they can do and handle in a day, you'd be, you know, it's a But is this a today, today issue or is this a longer term issue? Well, I think the issue the, today is will people buy electric cars? Will they buy well, well, hybrid that's cars? That's another question. They're, they're that's another good. question, but I mean, I think that, that, that uh, because I come from Toyota, I'm not bragging, you know, taking Toyota's side, but because I was in the Toyota organization for the last 10 years, I saw what the hybrid, you know, components came up and how they were able to train the people. And when they first came out with the first uh, Prius, you know, all the, the voltage and the, you know, the, the whatever uh, electrical power there was, it was trained and everybody had to have one train. And, but then they, they came up and they adapted and, and to me it's a transition. So no question, I, I would want point. my dealership to be the local Best Buy. I would want to have that type of reputation. If someone's going to buy a cell phone and they want it sick to the hands-free in the car, I don't want them to go somewhere else to do that. I want them to come to my store to do that. So I'm going to set up a little kiosk or I'm going to set up a little piece of my service department that's going to deal with consumer electronics and the vehicles that I sell. That seems to me only to be logical. And, and, and to me the solution is really easy. You, you, you go to a high school right. and, you, and you hire you know, what everybody would say is the geek. Bring them in every day from 4 till 7. Pay them good money, and that's when you bring your, your sink in and he shows you how all that gadgetry works and all that kind of stuff. And, and there's a very different uh, so, point of view talking about technologies like sync that are relative to the value of the car relatively small yeah. versus technologies like alternate powertrains, which relative yeah. to the value of the, the car are, are very, very, very large. Yeah. I personally think dealers have outsmarted it as all. We underestimate their capability. They dealt with the hybrid issue really well the past decade, and they're going to deal with the plug-in electric vehicles very well this decade. They're not going to sell them. They sold 50,000 hybrids. They sold 16 million vehicles that they could fix. <laughs> in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And this coming decade, if they sell 50,000 plug-in electrics, I'd be surprised. Uh, give the industry the benefit of the doubt, it's 100,000. We're going to probably buy closer to 17, 18 million gasoline-powered vehicles or diesel-powered vehicles that will be in the shops of the car dealers producing a lot of profitability for every car dealer. The car dealer is smarter than all of us. And their the transition period will be long enough that they can adapt. To oh, uh, of course it's, it's, it's going to be decades. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> You'll have the odd dealer that won't adapt, and, you know, but most of the modern dealers, and like you say, the younger people don't come out of the tech school like before with a uh, make a, a cars and how to overall an engine that doesn't I don't think it exists anymore or not too many. I'm asked all the time when will it be how long will it be before 50 percent of vehicle sales are an alternate technology like a plug-in electric or diesel natural gas and my own view is it's probably 50 years and it wouldn't surprise me if it's 20 one year 2100 it's a hundred years out 90 more years out before we actually get to 50%. And we keep finding fuel in the ground and you know we're not running out. They keep talking about this. I remember my first studies in the 1960s where we're gonna run out of fuel by the end of the century. No, now it's 2050, 2060, et cetera, et cetera. Are we gonna see then government intervention at a certain point start to reflect Well, this is the collision. Well, this, well, is, this is the, this is the collision. In, in, in an absolute you know, free market society, you're probably right. But what's going to happen come 2016 when the government says the fleet average has to be this and you can't sell enough cars to meet that? Are they going to turn off the tap on the... For, on the for a consumer, uh, 2016 isn't problematic. We've got 280 million used vehicles that are very well built on the road. And they can just, they can find any vehicle they want in the marketplace what, for another decade, two decades. Agreed. What's come come 2025, 20, 2030, if the government were to be restrictive through that ramp up for 10 or 15 years, that, then the consumer ultimately runs out of used vehicles. That's then there's a problem. From the consumer standpoint, well, it's a problem before that. The manufacturer dealer standpoint. Jerry, yeah, there's a, a problem corporate. before that because once the customer starts buying all those used vehicles and the new car sales disappear and the manufacturer starts closing plants, right. unemployment starts going up again, somebody else comes in and says, oh, we can't have that happening. And so the government says, well, maybe we ought to be lifting these fuel efficiency standards so that people start buying again. 
So yeah, something's yeah, got to give between yeah. now and Yeah, but remember, that's a corporate average fuel economy. That's so right. so they can come up and spend a lot of money on the lower end to, to get their average there. So they can produce. Still people have to buy. Yeah. I know, <laughs> but I mean, I mean the they still have like the Prius or other the the Corolla or inside or that helps their corporate average fuel economy. It's not volume. But I don't think it's a, oh, it I don't think volume. it's a weighted average. It's a volume. Yeah. 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 It's okay, a volume. So what yeah. what, yeah, what you percentage can't sell that Prius is to make yeah. up the What data. percentage yeah. of vehicles today is it a weighted meet the thirty five uh, per gallon standard? Oh probably less than five percent, I would guess. Yeah, right. it's 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 very it's a low single digit. It's low single I mean, that's, digit. That's like six and a half liters per hundred. So there right. there's not many around. Because around. I think in no. Canada the latest the data that I saw this is probably a year old now is I think there was like maybe Three or four. But never underestimate the ability of the consumer to work around these regulations, the dealers to work around the regulations, no and the vehicle companies to work around the regulations. It's all in their best interest. So, the fundamental issue with fuel efficiency, it's very different regulating fuel efficiency versus safety and the criteria air contaminant emissions. Those other two big regulatory areas could be solved with technology. It doesn't matter whether you buy a Hummer today, if you can still get one, or a smart car. They don't emit any criteria or contaminants. It's virtually right. eliminated. Right. With fuel efficiency, it doesn't matter what the vehicle company does. It's the consumer that decides. So you can have the most fuel efficient fleet in the marketplace, and the consumer may not buy your product, or within your product, they'll buy the you know, the forerunner instead of, you know, the uh, Yaris. But then you go back to politics again. If you're going to legislate all the safety that the vehicles have to have, right. you're adding weight to the vehicle, which impacts on fuel efficiency. Therefore, you Got can't it. have both. And because the Make consumer... Make what you want. And, and because the consumer gets to cho choose, no politician is going to tell the voter that he can't buy what he wants. Instead, they're going back to the same old, same old. They've got the wrong target this time. We'll target the vehicle companies. We'll go out and beat them up. We will force them to meet the, these standards. They, with fuel efficiency, they got the wrong target. That's right. The target isn't the vehicle companies. They're not the problem. It's the consumer. It's the consumer. Yeah. Yeah, chooses but, not to buy them. But the, consumer, really but the consumer has a vote. The consumer the has a vote. The company doesn't I agree. have a vote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's just that's the European model. Like, why is diesel so much more expensive over in Europe than this year? Because they, they put the onus on the individual to choose, and that drives the industry. They in also years. subsidize the price of diesel fuel to encourage people to buy diesel. So again, the politician yeah. is entering but, into the market. And, and the emission standards are weighted towards diesel as opposed to gas. So that's why more diesels are, are built. So, so, but at the end of the day, all of this creates a complexity and a market situation where the dealer fundamentally doesn't have to worry about it. The because there's going to be mass confusion. Consumers aren't going to embrace these things. Dealers aren't going to embrace them. We're going to buy, who knows, 17, 18 million gasoline or diesel-powered vehicles this decade, and dealers are going to be quite fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it is the solution to the issue, as you pointed out in the past, if you want people to buy smaller and more fuel-efficient cars, the price of gasoline is the lever. But what politician is going to use it? The more expensive the gasoline, the more small fuel efficient cars you're going to sell. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty direct function.